The Department of Fish and Game meets in April to decide the fate of this year's salmon fishing season. It's expected that certain types of salmon will return in higher numbers, but the coho salmon population has sharply declined. From KQED's Quest series, here's a story about efforts to protect the coho in Northern California and the important role salmon plays in the native ecosystem. In the northern reaches of California, a cool stream rambles through the shade of the redwood canopy. Within the cool water lives the past, present, and future of the native forest. Biologists and researchers are on a fishing expedition, searching for the one that's getting away. It's Courtney and I found our first fish of the day. When we got closer, we noticed that there were in fact two fish, one larger female and a smaller jack. Following the instincts of their ancestors, coho salmon are returning from the ocean to the very streams where they were born. Here, in a cycle of renewal, they will spawn and die, but give new life to not only the next generation of salmon, but to the forest itself. The temperate rainforests of the Pacific coast are home to some of the largest trees in the world. The scientific question is, how can these massive redwoods grow in soil that is considered nutrient poor and nitrogen deficient? One of the reasons why redwoods grow as big as they grow, it's because they get first class fish fertilizer. Um, the salmon and sort of their habitats have evolved together. Uh, the salmon have very specific requirements from their habitat, and the habitat gets a great deal from the salmon because they go out into the ocean and they get all these nutrients and they bring them back. Core samples from ancient redwoods have suggested the best tree growth years also coincide with years of good salmon runs. With thousands of coho in the coastal streams, we're gonna continue to have healthy redwood forests and healthy habitats to support bears, foxes, river otters, herons, you name it. So if you wanna see the beautiful redwood coastal ecosystems survive, you're gonna to need to advocate for more coho survival as well. There was a time when it was said the rivers and streams of Northern California were so thick with salmon that you could walk across their backs and not get your feet wet. Historically, the most abundant species in the state has been the Chinook or King Salmon. But in the last 10 years, the thriving Chinook fishery has crashed. This drop prompted the federal government to completely cancel the salmon fishing seasons in California for 2008 and 2009. Today, all the salmon species found in the state are at risk, but the coho, already low in numbers and off limits to all fishing, is in the most peril and may be facing extinction. Coho salmon in California are listed as critically endangered. We need to do everything we possibly can to allow the, the diminished fish populations we have to survive. The importance of protecting these fish is really protecting the environment that we all depend on. The causes of salmon decline are many. Dams, overfishing, logging, and water diversion are much to blame. But natural conditions like drought and temperature fluctuations in the ocean, which have reduced nutrients for salmon, also have played a role. Salmon are anadromous. That means they're born in fresh water, migrate to the ocean where they grow to adulthood, then return to the rivers to lay their eggs. As a result, they're vulnerable both in the watershed and in the ocean. In years when the nursery habitat is good and the fresh water and the ocean conditions are poor, which is a natural cycle, the fish can kind of get along. But when we have poor habitat conditions inland and poor ocean conditions like we have now, uh, that buffer is gone. And so the, the population staggers and, and crashes like it is now. The habitat of the Russian River has been so impacted that direct human intervention is needed now to keep the next generation of coho and possibly the future of the species alive. Those fish were at a breaking point. We have made the decision uh, back in 2001 to take some fish out of the wild, bring them into the hatchery with the idea of magnifying their numbers quickly to meet some of the habitat restoration projects. As it turns out, we were just in time because that fish population, that wild component of the fish population, 
no longer produces enough fish for us to rely on. At the Warm Springs Hatchery near Healdsburg, state biologists are taking a hands-on conservation approach to breed Russian River coho in captivity. When this program first started in 2001, we were able to collect wild fish for three consecutive years, which corresponds to the three-year life cycle that coho salmon are on. Well, beginning in 2004, the number of wild fish that we encountered was slim to none. So if we literally started our program a year later, we wouldn't have even had three consecutive year classes to do this. If we didn't act when we did, not only would we have not had this program, I don't think there would have been any hope for the coho salmon in the Russian River watershed. Think of this brood stock as a sort of genetic lifeboat for the species, with the goal that coho raised here will someday be able to live and breed on their own in the wild. Is that unlike production style facilities where there's sort of no end in sight in the making of these fish, we would love to back away at some point from all of this manipulation of this fish population and allow them to spawn, reproduce, return to the streams naturally on their own. But this is not the way salmon normally start their life. Right. Let's take a look at. Uh, so basically, our eggs. spawning uh, protocol here is different than typical hatcheries. Uh, we spawn all of our fish according to a, a breeding matrix. So that lets us know which males are the best appropriate spawning partners for each female. So that allows us to maximize our genetic variation and avoid any sort of inbreeding effects. So this is one female's um, eggs and, and uh, thus offspring spawn with four different males. And we keep them separate through the swim-up phase so we can see the success of not only the female, but each male that she spawned with. And we can really track the, the success of each fish in our program to the next generation. 38.3. When the fish are about a year old, they're implanted with a tiny tracking device before being released into the wild. But hatcheries alone can't save the salmon. Water diversions must be reduced, logging and development moved away from stream edges, and obsolete dams modified to allow salmon to pass. Only then will the natural setting be right for the coho to return and achieve true long-term sustainability. Well, we're certainly optimistic about the return of, of coho. Everything's right here. We've got great habitat. We've got improved practices. Now we need the right set of winter conditions and the right set of summertime conditions. Everything is intertwined. The water, the trees, the salmon, and us. Connecting the dots and understanding the importance of maintaining the whole system may be the key to saving it all. I believe that if everything comes together the way it needs to, that eventually we will have viable fisheries again. It's going to take a lot of work, and it's going to take a lot of sacrifice on a lot of people's parts. The question is whether or not they're willing to make that sacrifice. But I think that they are worth saving, not just because they taste good, but also because you know they're a very important part of an entire ecological system. And I think if we lose our healthy watersheds, I think if we lose our, our coastal streams, we will have lost something much more important than simply the salmon. Three. Well, for more stories about the salmon and updates on this year's fishing season, visit KQED's science and environment series, Quest, at kqed.org quest.